Today we're going to talk about the effects of fashion economics and globalization, which is basically sustainability for people and the planet. So they're both close to my heart, and we're going to look at the sustainability and globalization through the lens of the fashion economy. So Villanova, we know, is an institution of higher learning and serving the greater good. We have high academic excellence and using our talents to ignite change in our communities and beyond. Today, we're going to talk about just that through something that we all love here, fashion. So by a show of hands, how many like new clothes? How many like to get something that's new and trendy, especially if it doesn't cost too much? OK. How many of you know what fast fashion is? OK. So clothes are an everyday necessity. They keep us warm. And for many, it's an important aspect of self-expression. So fashion's a $3 trillion industry and one of the largest production and consumption rates in the world. So approximately one in six people in the world work in some part of the fashion industry, making it the most labor dependent industry. So fast fashion was able to emerge, the kind of cheap, trendy clothes that are easy to get and easy to access. Um, because apparel companies move production to, to developing nations in order to have much lower labor costs, which saves them money. And it allows the price of your clothing from stores like this to dramatically decline which means you can buy more faster, and that's fast fashion. So the way clothes are made and used today is extremely wasteful. We're going to talk about sustainability. Very wasteful, and it's um, polluting for the environment. And it's contaminated with human rights abuses as well. A lot of the people in the supply chain are not treated well. And we don't really know that when you're a consumer or working in a fashion business. So that's why I'm here today to talk about it, so that you're really more aware when you go back into your, uh, into your future into your career. So there's personal and peer pressure also, I understand, on having the latest trend, wearing something that's cool and hip for your Friday night or date. But do you know where these clothes come from and what the effects are on people and the planet? So I'd like to share with you a film today to explain a little bit about the why. And we're going to talk about it won an award for the Los Angeles Film Festival. It's called Made in Mexico. And it will show you an insider's view on what it's like where they make a lot of these inexpensive and new trendy clothes called fast fashion. It's only about 14 minutes long, so I hope you enjoy it. Because it's what I know. I work uh, for, I have two companies that I founded. One is jewelry and one is chocolate. And I work, as Michelle said, <laughs> in developing nations with the workers, the farmers, the artisans of jewelry and of cacao that we make chocolate from. So. I know these stories, but this is the best way of telling it. Remake is really great because they tell the stories. It's a programming education uh, platform that has videos, and you can follow them on Instagram and learn about, more about your fashion. Um, how many of you are aware that that's what it's like in the factories where a lot of the, the fast fashion comes from? Anyone? You know? OK. Where, could someone tell me where you've heard that before? Did you know from online? or? OK. And I think that those similar jobs. Yes, good. But it's a lot longer, so it has a lot more time to kind of go. Yeah, it really is a deep dive. Yeah. It's a lot more on all the resources used and the waste created and more kind of the harmfulness of having these 52 seasons of fashion. Yes. And the disposability of it because of that. Uh huh. Yeah, no, it's terrific. I love that movie. Um, it's very eye-opening. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit, just because you're a business student and you're going to work in, um, and some of you are arts and sciences, but you're going to work in, in industry and maybe in fashion. So you'll be making decisions on one side of the table, and also in your, your personal life, you're going to be making conscious choices in your purchasing power. So I just want you to know a little bit of the history of things, and we'll talk a little bit, and sh I'll show a fun video at the end to lighten it up, OK? Um, so obviously, I showed this to show you a major problem that exists in the fashion industry and production. So we'll talk a little history, just so you know. And you can bring that um, kind of as your, your education where you go into the workforce. So before the invention of the sewing machine in the 1840s, 
the emergence of the consumer class in the Industrial Revolution, Britain and America, were hubs of textile and fashion production. So the fabrics and also the production of the clothes, the dresses, the shirts, and the pants. So Britain was the first country to industrialize, the UK, and the Industrial Revolution catalyzed consumer culture the way we have it today. It just started it. Um, so the transformation in Britain ultimately led to the reorganization of labor that led to the factory. So these are factories. Then um, Britain's cotton and wool industry had an enormous impact on the British economic development. So the United States really was sort of next, as in many things. They, their industrialization of textiles was led by basic manufacturing from spinning to weaving and then printing. And then actually slavery in the South enabled a low price for American raw cotton. And the overseas, the wealthy consumers and the factories were more than happy to, to <coughs> purchase that low cost because it lowered the cost of their final products. So this um, transferred America's infrastructure, connecting slaves in the South to wage workers in the North, and then manufacturers and consumers in Europe. So along the way, the fashion's always been a low capital and labor intensive industry characterized by low entry barriers and standardized production to mass market. So for economic reasons, the rise in globalization came and apparel companies continuously shifted more and more production to developing countries. So there were ample amounts of low skilled and low cost laborers. The bulk of today's garment manufacturing has moved to countries including Mexico, China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. And many of them have the same issues that garment workers 100 years ago in the United States had. So it hasn't really, the situation has remained somewhat the same, it's just moved. And that's something that I think is interesting to know, especially as you see the future of the fashion industry and the future of your sort of shopping habits. So clothing shopping used to be more of an occasional event. Now we kind of can go out and get things quickly, inexpensively for a new top for a Friday night. They, um, it changed about 20 years ago. So right when I was leaving Villanova, it sort of changed and fast fashion began to happen. Due to globalization and economics, the clothes became cheaper, the cycles got faster, and shopping became a form of entertainment. So it originated in Europe to meet the rapidly changing preferences of young women like yourselves who want something that's the latest trend, but at a fraction of the cost. So the faster fashion was made, then the worse the workers were in poor working conditions with low pay in order to create all our clothes. So exactly how fast is fast fashion? Some of you may have seen some movies like The True Cost, but this really spells it out. The average consumer bought 60% more clothing in 2014 than 2000, but kept each garment half as long. So it's easy to buy fast, buy cheap, and then toss it and get something new. And that's the problem because it's a really dangerous cycle. So between 2000 and 2014, global clothing production doubled and the number of garments purchased each year by the average consumer increased by around 60%. So as we said earlier, the traditional fashion generally has two cycles, spring and fall, more or less. Typical fast fashion has 50 cycles per year. So that's new clothes coming into the store almost every week. From a consumer, kind of, if you're not going to dig deep and think about it, it sounds kind of fun. But when you think about the plight of these workers in Made in Mexico film or Bangladesh and other things, and as well as the problems with the environment, it really doesn't make any sense. So 80% of garment makers around the world are women in their early 20s, and they have low wages, many have sexual harassment actually, as you saw in the movie, and a lack of upward mobility. They can't go anywhere, they're just kind of wage workers. And the whole intention from the business, <laughs> since we're at Bartley for the business school, the whole intention behind the way the system works is to maximize profit through minimizing cost, and then labor being treated as one of those costs. So that's why it's sort of a vicious cycle, and it's difficult to change. So fast fashion also hurts the planet. The environment's something that we all care about now. It takes, as you may have heard, 4,000 liters of water to make just one pair of jeans. And the fashion industry is responsible for 10% of annual global carbon emissions, 
more than all international flights and maritime shipping combined. So at this pace, the greenhouse gas emissions will surge more than 50% by 2030. That's insane. So not just people, not just the planet, but the waste. So when you go out and you get the cheap shirt for Friday night, and then you kind of get bored with it, it's, it was only 20 bucks and you want something different. One garbage truck of clothes are burned or landfilled every second. So when you toss it away, sometimes giving to charity is good. There's just so much overflow of people throwing away that there are just piles of it in landfills. That's enough to fill one and a half Empire State Buildings every day and enough to fill Sydney Harbor in Australia every year. So the waste part, especially for the environment, as long as, and it's, help, it's hurting people along the way, it just doesn't make any sense. So there were two major noteworthy fatal events in history that are really important to know about. There was a fa famous fire of garment workers in New York called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911. So that was when all the production of the clothes was in, much of it was in America, in the US, in New York. And it was a fatal fire and collapsed and people, many people died. There was another one in 2013, which is a more recent example, called Rana Plaza in Bangladesh. And that killed over 1,000 workers. This is Rana Plaza, which some of you may have seen or heard of before because it's more recent. But it's important to know about both in your future careers and as you're going to shop and buy things and think about your conscious choices. So it was at these moments, including that are highlighted in the True Cost film, where consumers really started to think about questioning the fast fashion and wondering what's the true cost of those five $10 t-shirts. So some com companies campaign for better working conditions and wages, but the pressure remains across the industry to push costs lower. It's basically a supply demand thing and they're trying to cut their costs to make their profits. So I'll tell you one little story because you'll go out there and you'll meet people and you'll think about what did you, maybe you'll take one little thing to tip away. I had someone that was trying to help me with my business of a famous fashion designer once. Uh, this is about five years ago. And he said, you move overseas, you squeeze the factories to make your margins. And he had given a couple idea, good ideas before that, but once he said that, I said, get out of here. <laughs> um, I couldn't believe someone told me that. So it was my choice and my Villanova values my, that I learned from my family and from Villanova that helped me to step away from that person because I realized he wasn't going to help me build a sustainable business with ethical values that I could be proud of. So fast fashion is not equitable for its workers. It's bad for the environment. And the economics are not sustainable as your generation and the millennials are starting to make good choices to vote with their wallets and try to raise the profile of businesses who are doing good. So we have to make a change and it's hard, but it has to be a systemic change. And that's why I'm here today. So as a consumer, we have the power to vote with our wallets for what kind of world we want. We can consider the environment, the people, both. And it's called conscious consumerism. So we have to stop the demand for the fast fashion and create the demand for the ethical fashion and the good choices. Now it's a little tougher than it sounds because you do have to think <coughs> that sometimes ethical clothes cost a little bit more and that's a concern your college students, so it, it is an issue. But it's better to buy one shirt that you're really proud of and sort of wear your values and you can hold on to it longer, it will have a longer life rather than just getting something that's cheap and it'll fall apart anyway. So you're all gonna be forced to make business decisions. I just gave an example of, of what I had to deal with once. And I hope you'll remember some lessons today from the women in Mexico to the environmental issues that we're learning about. And it's gonna play a part in your business careers, but also how we dress is something we enjoy and it's a method of self-expression. So when you have your business career, you think about the customer, and you are customers now. So in the future, you'll be on both sides of the, the cash register, and you'll have to think about what makes sense and what did you learn today. So we're going to end on a lighter note, 
and then we'll take questions. But I want to know how can you and I together make a difference in these worker lives, in people and the planet through how we shop, how we dress. So a few friends of mine from an agency I'm involved with called Role Models Management and Remake in conjunction with Remake has produced a small film, 10 Tips How to Dress Like a Sustainable Fashion Pro. Ooh. OK, so I hope that ended on a little bit of a lighter note. Also something tangible you can do. We talked about the problem. We talked about the solution. This is a, some fashion sketches I thought were really cool. And these are pictures of me with some women in factories where I work. This is in, uh, in, in Jaipur, India, women that sort the beads and help uh, do some of the process of the jewelry, the stones that are in the jewelry we wear and I design. And then this is my friend Saida, who I've spoken about in the past. And she's a jewelry designer in Afghanistan. And she came to visit me in New York once. And uh, it was really terrific to know exactly who makes my jewelry that I design. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer about either my background in fashion or about sustainable fashion. We can open the floor to anyone that has a question. Yes, Keely. Um, how did you go about being able to find either like the manufacturers or the producers or the people who make the products themselves? Was that like a hard? It is a hard question. Thank. I mean, it's a good question. It's a hard process. Um, I don't know if you could hear over here. She's asking how I found suppliers to work. The internet has changed the world. So just like we talked about fast fashion in the past 20 years, the internet has changed the world since then. So I am pretty good at outsourcing, and I go exactly to the source of where I find things. There are organizations, like one called uh, The Common Good, that connects fashion brands with suppliers. But I always find that through some research and meeting people, for example, this factory here, I just did a, a great Google search and found someone that advertised on their website based in New York that they have ethical trade and that they have vetted factories and vetted mines where they get the stones because that's another problem. Um, it's just the same way that you have fabric and then production for dresses, you have stones and metal mining, and that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> uh, but they put me in touch with Jaipur. And I was able to go over and visit the factory, meet the people who exactly w made these earrings and made this bracelet. And they taught me how to cut the stones on the wheel that they do. And that worked for that. Um, there are organizations <laughs> that support a lot of social entrepreneurs um, that support giving be living wage, better wages to their workers. For example, the farmers that I work with for the chocolate, I visited them in Guatemala and Colombia with the US government as well. And there's an organization called Uncommon Cacao that oversees a woman, an American woman that lives in the jungle, and she oversees the to market, go to market for the cacao farmers and gets them a premium price. So we only pay them a premium. We don't take advantage of them like a lot of the, the organizations do. There's child labor and cacao in Africa. There's a lot of people trying to sort of scam and squeeze the, the farmers as well. So by building these two businesses that I've done, I find that it's leading by example. By finding a product that you can be proud of, you can bring it to a dinner party, you can bring it to your friend's house, give a gift to your teacher. And it's a, a chocolate bar that you know is ethically traded and pure ingredients. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes? My average day, well, my average day, I work uh, from home in a home office. And it's a lot at my laptop. So this is pretty much my best friend during the day. And I'm doing a lot of coordination. It's, I'm not sure if you've had entrepreneurship classes, but the general coursework that you have here tells you about the different facets of a business. And I have my hands in everything. Um, with the chocolate business, I co-founded it and have stepped back to focus on jewelry because two businesses at once is a lot. We have uh, six employees for the chocolate business. We've got, uh, I work with a number of artisans for jewelry and it's better to focus and streamline. So that's what I do now. I work with, I may work with um, 
emailing the factory in Jaipur. I'm going to go visit them in, in April. Uh, and as Michelle said, I started my career as a fashion model after business school, uh, Villanova Business School. So I went and you get the experience first, and then you can figure out what you want to do with that later. I, that's really my, my main lesson for career advice. Anyone else? Yes. Mm -hmm. So like how can you like how do you not focus like solely on profit and like have like higher goals with your career and like obviously well, there's like the ethical benefits. Yeah, you know it's it's a hard thing to do and that's why so many businesses have trouble. The question was how do you balance profit and your values in a business sense? So there are a lot of businesses that just don't care and they're getting called out now because the consumers are voting with their wallets and it's about demand. So each one of you has the power to really make a difference with what you choose. And we're going to roll out this across the, the country, actually, um, this program to educate others. And Villanova is always an innovative institution, so we really wanted to uh, start here. But people are already doing it. You saw the models up here. All That's how they shop. They trade. We wear secondhand. And it's just I send my leftovers to some friends around and um, share. And, I take leftover friend, a friend's clothes and buy secondhand vintage. It's very cool. Everyone's talking about sustainability and fashion. So it's really become a sort of business peer influence on the profit motives, pure profit. So that guy that I mentioned that you know tried to turn me the profit way, I, um, I'm no longer in touch with him for obvious reasons, but I don't think he's in business anymore because he's been pushed out by people who are really caring. So sustainability matters, people care. You saw Greta Thunberg was on the cover of Time Magazine as the most influential person in the world. Um, so it, I think companies have to care because the consumers care. So it's really a supply and demand thing. And you can do it internally as an entrepreneur. If you're working for a Ralph Lauren or, or a certain other company, you can just have your values be an influence in your, some of your decisions. You may not be able to change the whole company, but you can vote with your words, vote with your, your values. And I think you can make a difference that way and when you're working for larger companies. Yes? Pretending. Yes. Well, so that's a great question. And something called greenwashing, I don't know if you've heard that word, but a lot of the brands, including H&M, they say they have their conscious collection. It's not. It's, they are forced to do better. Zara is forced to do better for the next, uh, I think they have a next three to five years, they're going to go totally sustainable because people like you and the models here and people like me are not going to shop there anymore because we realize that they're having problems and sustainability issues, both people and the planet. So there's an app called Good On You app, Good On You, where you can see sustainable brands and see a little bit more about while you're shopping, you can just kind of scan the, the code and see, or check out the brand and see if it's good. Um, you can see about environment, you can see their ratings. Remake actually has a rating system. So their website has brands that are good and brad, brands that are bad. And so you can kind of know and it guides you of the authenticity of that. But the greenwashing is a problem, and it's something that I think is it's becoming less possible to fake the consumers because you know you're smart and you really care. Anyone else? Yes. Um, My favorite sustainable brands. Well, Catherine Parr jewelry definitely, <laughs> <laughs> and Paré talk a lot. Um, I think Stella McCartney was really a forerunner in the sustainable fashion movement. She's been doing that forever. Um, and it was before it was cool. So that's what innovators do, as you all know, from your marketing classes. So I think when you're doing it in the beginning, before it's really caught on, that's when it's really cool. And then when people are doing it later, you really can be happy about that. Um, 
I think Reformation's another brand that's good. I love, to be honest, I love vintage clothes. I think secondhand and pre-owned is great. It's like, just makes sense economically and you get something really nice. And I, so I shop from stores, like there's the Real Real is a website that has pre-owned clothes, so, but they vet the quality. So you're not gonna get something that has holes in it. It's, it's still cool to go. I, there's a market in Paris, my favorite market from, I've been going to for 20 years and there are little vintage boutiques there with old clothes that are like, you know, Gucci, Prada, Chloe, but from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I love to get pieces from there because no one else will have it. It's not like you go to the party and like everyone's wearing the same top. I have something super cool. So that's actually my ultimate favorite. I also like that, you know, I talked about history of the of fashion production because I thought it was good for you to know. Uh, maybe it's a little academic, but I think it's important to know. And I think the history of fashion actually is really cool and interesting. The creativity of fashion, the styles and how different it's been over the years. So when you get something that's like kind of old and cool and no one else will have it, what's better than that? Any other questions? Are we? No? Well, thank you so much for your time. It's so great being back here on campus. <laughs>